Welcome our dear uh, viewers to this uh, special edition of our program Africa Today. In uh, today's edition we are dedicating our episode to the visit by Arab League uh, Secretary General Ahmed Abul Ghait uh, uh, who is uh, having a one day visit to, to Beirut. A few minutes ago we were uh, broadcasting the live press conference for the Secretary General in Beirut. To shed more light on that we are very much delighted to be joined over the phone by Ambassador Mithat El Miligi, former Assistant Foreign Minister Good afternoon to you, Mr. Ambassador. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon to you, sir. Uh, sir, the uh, visit uh, by uh, the Secretary General uh, of the Arab League, Ahmad Abu al uh, to Beirut. How do you see the significance of uh, this uh, visit uh, in light of the very alarming situation on the ground in Lebanon? Well, actually, I think this is a very important visit. Uh, Mr. Ahmad Abu al would not take such a decision if he didn't have a consensus from all the Arab countries to mm. uh, go on with this visit, which means that all the Arab states are supporting Lebanon in the current ordeal and the aggression from the Israeli army. And I think that Mr. Abu Ghraid stressed mm. clearly uh, on the need to reach an immediate ceasefire in Lebanon and the, the, that, that Lebanon should... Uh, should obtain guarantees that Israel will stop its raids and its aggression on the Lebanese soil. Um, I think that uh, besides that, of course, we spoke about the internal situation uh, in, in, in Lebanon, about uh, the necessity to reach a consensus uh, president that should be elected for Lebanon as soon as possible, mm -hmm. and, of course, the implementation of the UN resolution, as we all know, 1701, and its execution as soon as possible. I think those were, uh, were the main uh, lines of the visit of Mr. Ahmed Abu Ghaid, which is to once again reiterate, reiterate the, uh, the, the stand of the Arab countries behind Lebanon mm. in the current uh, situation, yeah. and that uh, we as Arab states do not accept the aggression of uh, Israel, because sometimes actually Israel uh, mm. tend to uh, create what seems to be a vacuum between mm. the Arab countries by uh, citing that uh, there are Arab countries who are in contact with the Israeli leaders and asking them mm. to continue their bombing and their shelling, which is of course a total lie yeah. proven by His Excellency, the visit of His Excellency Mr. Abu Ghraid to yeah. Lebanon, which cannot happen if mm. all the players and all the members of the Arab League would not have accepted mm. this visit. Indeed. Uh, uh, so in uh, the press uh, conference, uh, Mr. Abu Ghraid uh, confirmed again that the Lebanese government is only one responsible for negotiating on behalf of the state to reach an immediate ceasefire and full implementation to the uh, 1701 resolution. What's your take on that, Mr. Ambassador? Well, uh, I mean, we have to differentiate between two things. The first thing, which is the real situation on the ground, which have put uh, Hezbollah in mm. uh, the defense line against the sovereignty of Lebanon against the Israeli forces, and, and what the mm. uh, international uh, law stipulates, which is that the government of Lebanon is the only responsible of uh, any military uh, mm. movement in, uh, on its soil. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to differentiate w w between this and that. The idea is that Hezbollah is taking a large part, and uh, there is a big debate whether this is uh, a legal force to take the action, or should the army be the one taking the action, which is the regular things. Unfortunately, yeah. because of the creation of uh, this militia, uh, this is what helped to complicate the situation mm -hmm. and yeah. actually enabled Israel to uh, continue its trade, claiming that it's uh, doing this against what mm. could be or could be seen as an illegal body in Lebanon. And I think that uniting the forces between uh, the, the official mm. uh, government of Lebanon and Hezbollah would definitely, uh, would definitely give a result mm. that Israel cannot claim that it's only uh, after a terrorist group and not after the Lebanese and uh, the Lebanese sovereignty as yes. a whole. And I think that Mr. Abu Ghraid, when he asked for a president of the republic and the necessity to elect a president to the republic, 
uh, embedded this, uh, this uh, to, to, to abolish this, yes. uh, this uh, let's say, unfortunate situation by the necessity of creating Hezbollah to fight Israel. Yes, indeed. Uh, finally, Mr. Ambassador, uh, the role of the international community and uh, the Security Council, as uh, the uh, Arabic Secretary General said, that all the international partners are silent and everyone is saying we are waiting till the American elections. Uh, how do you see uh, this statement here by the Arab League Secretary General and to what extent the situation of uh, the American election is affecting the situation uh, in the region, especially in Lebanon and Gaza furthermore? Well, on the ground it's definitely affecting the situation because it's enabled Israel to continue with its war crimes. I mean, uh, the vacuum uh, present right now since President Biden is about to leave the office, while we don't know who is going to be the next president, whether mm. it's going to be the vice president, yes. Mr. Ha Ms. Harris, or uh, ex-President Trump uh, is going to be empowered. This is creating a certain vacuum in the American administration, enabling Israel to mm. foster on this and to continue its illegal uh, occupation an unlawful occupation mm -hmm. of the Palestinian territories according to the International Court of Justice, yeah. and also to continue with the massacres and the war crimes against the Palestinian and the Lebanese and the Syrian and the Yemeni uh, people. Having mm -hmm. said that, uh, actually the word uh, community does not mm -hmm. really have an excuse and should not use this uh, as a reason. I mean, if the, the Americans are having uh, some bit of uh, instability due to the election, but the world community does not have the same circumstances, and that uh, their uh, their uh, their decision yeah. should should emanate from their own position, and they should not find an excuse or look for an excuse to not to take actions. I mean, if I want, for instance. As a, as, a, as a Western country to recognize Palestine, I don't need a new election in the United States to be able to do that. If I want to stop mm. arming Israel, I don't need the United States to be able to do that. If I want to support the Palestinians in their struggle for freedom, I don't need the United States to do that. So mm. actually this is more of an excuse to rest and uh, let Israel mm. continue with what it's doing under the pretext mm -hmm. of what it's doing. I mean, uh, I would just add one last sentence, yes, if I may. Uh, pre President Biden has given Israel uh, just mm. last week, uh, even in, in, in four or five days ago, he has given them uh, a delay of one month mm. to allow humanitarian aid to enter northern Gaza. Yeah. Why do we need one month to do that except for the reason to enable Israel to continue with its plan until it reaches its objects and then... Mm. Uh, the American decision is going to be eligible to, to be executed. Yeah, I mean, this is totally nonsense. Yes. The, uh, we do not need one month, one full month, yes. in which thousands and thousands of Palestinians are going to be killed in order just to enable humanitarian aid to enter. Yes. People are starving and they are dying of thirst because of the lack of any, uh, any vital uh, elements. Indeed, and yet, Ambassador Mr. Biden, uh, for one month. Uh, former Assistant Foreign Minister, thank you so much for your uh, precious uh, input. And uh, moving on to our report here, where Mauritania has once again become a crucial departure point for migrants risking uh, the Atlantic journey to Spain's Canary Island, uh, capturing renewed attention from the European Union. EU leaders are worried about a surge in undocumented migrants as more Africans head to Mauritania and attempts to enter Europe via the Canary Island. Mauritania has once again become a crucial departure point for migrants risking the treasurer's Atlantic journey to Spain's Canary Islands, capturing renowned attention from the European Union. The small West African nation is witnessing a significant uptick in migrants using its shores as a launch pad for their request to reach Europe through the Spanish island, with many tragically losing their lives along the way. The period between January and March 2024 saw a significant surge in undocumented migration to the Canary Islands, with over 12,393 migrants arriving compared to just 2,178 during the same period the previous year. This
farming increase underscores the growing role of Mauritania as a transit route for migrants despite the inherent dangers associated with the sea passage. This trend persists even in light of recent financial agreement between the EU and Mauritania and at reducing migrant arrivals. And the 80% of the record 163 million Africans facing acute food insecurity are in conflict-affected countries, including potentially 840,000 people confronting famine in Sudan, South Sudan, and in Mali. An estimated 163 million Africans are facing acute food insecurity, sustaining the record numbers of Africans experiencing food crisis. This total is nearly triple the number from five years ago, highlighting the rapid escalation in Africa's food security. Some 130 million, 80 percent of those facing acute food insecurity are in countries experiencing conflict, many of which have presided for years and have eroded community and national coping mechanisms. 13 of the 16 African countries with the largest number of people experiencing acute food insecurity are in conflict, like Sudan, South Sudan. This pattern underscores that the conflict continues to be primary driver of acute food insecurity in Africa. 13 of the 16 African countries with the largest number of people experiencing acute food insecurity are in conflict. Famine has been confirmed in the region of Sudan, parts of South Sudan and Mali may also be experiencing famine conditions as well, though uh, inaccessibility has limited data collection and reporting. Nigeria, Sudan and the Democratic Republic of Congo are the three countries with the greatest number of acutely food insecure people, each with over 20 million individuals facing at least crisis levels of food security. Collectively, those three countries comprise about half of all people on the continent facing acute food insecurity. Nigeria and Sudan also saw the largest aggregate increase in the number of people acutely food insecure this past year, adding 6.8 million and 5.3 million people respectively. Four countries, South Sudan 64%, Sudan 53%, Namibia 48%, and the Central African Republic is 44%, have 40% or higher of their populations facing acute hunger. Well, with that, our dear viewers, we come to the end of this edition of our program Africa Today. Uh, till tomorrow with another crew, I'm Hesirabia signing off. Many thanks for watching.